Good evening. How are y'all doing? Uh, we are going to be talking about Paul's passion for the church. His passion for the church, which really is a passion that should be ours as well as Christians. And uh, we're at the point of First Timothy where we are getting to the theme verse of this whole book. We've mentioned this verse a few times in our past studies of First Timothy, uh, but what we're looking at tonight is actually that verse. We're only looking at verses 14, 15, and 16 in chapter 3, and uh, what we see here uh, is really the, the core of Paul's passion, his, his purpose really in, in all this writing, and his whole passion was simply this, that the church would conduct itself according to its confession, or to put it in modern terms, that we would walk in a way that lines up with what we say we believe, okay? Um, and, and really, that concept affects the whole mission of the church, uh, which is to expand the kingdom of heaven through the spreading of the gospel. That's the mission of the church. And Paul cared for the church in, in really an amazing way. He cared so much for the health of the church, the growth of the church, the, the, the spiritual maturity of the church. And uh, there was a guy named Timothy Dwight who was one of uh, an early uh, pastor, and I forget the name of the famous college that he was a uh, part of back in the 1800s, but he wrote this hymn that says, I love thy kingdom, Lord. And it really reveals a great heart for the church. And really, um, it was very apostolic, very Pauline. And, th- and this is what this hymn said that Timothy Dwight wrote in the 1800s. It says, For her my tears shall fall, for her my prayers ascend. To her my cares and toil be given till toils and cares shall end. That heart, that, that care and concern for the church um, is really something that we should all strive for as Christians, to care about the church, to care about this entity that God has created called the church um, because um, the great effect that, that the church has on God's purpose God's purposes in the world are, are done through the church. It's through us, his people. And so we should all individually have a great, great concern with the health of the church, the work of the church, the growth of the church, because we're a part of that entity, that organism. And so let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into looking at what Paul has to say tonight. Father, we thank you, God, for your word, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here again, Lord, to study it. Lord, your word is paramount. It is the foundation of everything, God. Lord, it is the very, very source of truth that we are to live by, that we are to, to, to operate by, to exist by, God. And Lord, this particular letter, as you've written it in, Lord, to be really a, a roadmap, a manual on the con- conduct of the church, Lord. God, that we would hear and understand what it is that you want us to do, Lord. We would understand how the confession that we have, the beliefs that we profess to believe in, God, Lord, when they line up with our life, It accomplishes your purpose in this world, that people would come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, we know that we are all screwed up sinners, and we all fall short. But Lord, we are so thankful that it is your Holy Spirit that works in and through us. God, that we would individually represent you and collectively shine as a beacon on a hill, Lord. So we thank you, God, and we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we get into the actual conduct and confession, I want to look first at Paul's description of the church. This is how he viewed the church. It's actually in verse 15, the second half of verse 15, which is really the theme verse here. But Paul said uh, that he was writing to Timothy so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. There's three important phrases there that Paul uses to describe the church, okay? The first one is God's household. The second one was the church of the living God. And the third one was the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so I kind of want to unpack these a little bit so we could understand what Paul meant when he meant the church, right? When he referred to the church, what he was talking about. So the first one he says is God's household. Now that word household is metaphorical language for family. God's family is what he's talking about. The same Greek word that is translated here, household, is translated in verses 4, verses 5, and verses 12 as family or families. And so what he's saying here is that the church is a family. It is a close-knit group of people who are related to one another, and we know it's through the blood of Christ. So God is the Father 
He is the father of this family. We as believers are, are his children. And so we are therefore brothers and sisters in the family of Christ. It's a very important understanding because, you know, oftentimes people, we, we understand the concepts of family in, in a secular sense because a lot of times people say, you know, oh, blood is thicker than water, right? And oh, my family, I'll, I'll die for my family, maybe for my friends, not so much for acquaintances, right? We, we get that concept, you see it in movies, you know, you know, family, you know, if you watch Fast and Furious, you know, family, that he says it through like all 15 of those movies, and so it's like the world gets the concept of family, how important it is, that you'll die for them, that you'll sacrifice for them. Well, that's what Paul is talking about here when he calls the church God's household. It is that we are God's family, and we are to have that kind of commitment to one another as God's family. And then this book goes on to talk about how there's elders and deacons that, that, are, that are raised up within God's family to be leaders to help carry out the Father's purposes within his family and how it, how it operates. Now, the fact that we are family has profound implications in our lives. What it means as we, we are God's family is that we are in eternal relationship with one another. Eternal. We are going to be family. If you are a believer, we are going to be family together forever. Forever. We will always be brothers and sisters. Now, the problem is we don't always get along. So for some people, that eternal aspect might not be so appealing, right? I don't want to be family forever with that person because they're a big jerk, you know? Or they rub me the wrong way. But it can be glorious when we draw close to the Father. It says this in 1 John 1, 3. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. Paul sa- or John says, What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. The very reason we're declaring to you what we've, what we've seen, the very reason we're telling, telling you about what we witnessed and experienced walking with Christ is so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. It's a concept of, of people seeking God and they draw closer together. Some of you have seen this before, the relational triangle, right? Is it on the screen? That? It's not up here, so I had to turn around. So, the relational triangle. Now, we most often have heard of the relational triangle in concepts of marriage, right? You, you, it's used in marriage counseling stuff. You know, you got the husband and the wife. And, and as long as the husband and wife individually are seeking God, they're going to naturally draw closer together. That's what the relational triangle is all about. But the concept applies to all of us, just as brothers and sisters in the household of God, as family members. When we don't get along, it's usually because we're not seeking Christ or we're not looking to Christ as how we should be treating one another, how we should be interacting with one another. When we start acting sinfully, it's because we're not looking to the Lord. But when we're all individually seeking Christ and pursuing him, we're naturally going to draw closer together in our relationship to one another as family. And the closer we get individually to Christ, the closer we're going to be together. A.W. Tozer said this, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same fork, are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned. Not to each other, but to another standard by which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers met together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscience and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. We're family. And if you're having issues with family, put your eyes on Christ and seek Christ. And seek to be like him, and to respond like him, and to talk like him, and to act like him. Seek that that, that, that Christ mindset. And you'll see your family issues get better. You'll see your squabbles and get better. And really, it is to your benefit to do that, because you're going to be family with these people forever. So it behooves us now to work on practice, to get good at Seeking Christ and knowing that as we seek him, we will naturally draw together with our family. But that's the first way Paul sees the church. He sees it as God's family, okay? The second thing he says is the church of the living God. 
Now, in the Old Testament, God is called the living God numerous times, and he's often called the living God to emphasize the deadness of idols. There's a lot of idol worship in the Old Testament. People would go to seek after other gods. And so God was often called the living God in contrast to dead idols. But it's also a favorite designation of God in the New Testament. There's 15 different times that he's called the living God in the New Testament, and it's always in context of emphasizing the fact that he is eternal and that he is immortal. That God is alive and has been alive forever and will be alive forever. That's what the phrase the living God refers to. It it stresses the fact that, that he is the source of life because he existed before creation. He is also the one who communicates life to believers in Christ, that it's through him imparting eternal life to us that we know we are also going to be eternally existent with him in heaven. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 kind of spoke of this, and it says, What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, um, it talked about, about us being built almost like a structure. It says, in him you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. So when Paul looked at the church and he said, you guys are the church of the living God, what he was talking about is because God dwells within us individually, when we come together, we are the structure that God dwells within. This is why oftentimes in churches, you know, you'll, you'll hear Bible studies say that church isn't the building, it's the people. That comes from this teaching. That when we gather together, we are the structure that God dwells within. Yes, there's buildings, and yes, there's homes, and yes, there's, you know, all kinds of, of physical structures all over the place. But when, when Paul is talking about we are the church of the living God, He's not talking about a denomination. He's not talking about a theological bent. He's talking about us, the people whom God dwells within. This is why gathering on Sundays or or at midweek service um, is such a big deal in Scripture. Scripture puts a big, big emphasis on us gathering together physically. Because all of us indwelt, we make up the dynamic assembly of the living God. And there's a vast spiritual encouragement in this for us. Here's how it works. Listening to God's word alone is a good thing. It's a good thing. Um, singing and praising to God alone is a good thing. It really is a good thing. But, but when we come together as the temple of the living God, and we sing praise and worship together, and we hear his word preached together, there's so much of a greater dynamic that takes place in our lives. Our hearing and our worship, they intensify, they, they, they expand, they're enhanced when we gather together. There's something that happens here as the Spirit is dwelling amongst all of us when we come together as God's people, as God's family, together in unity to praise him, to hear his word. Martin Luther said it this way, At home in my own house, there is no warmth or vigor in me. But in church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart, and it breaks its way through. This is why God is so adamant about us gathering together as believers. He said in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, he said, let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. How can you watch out for your brothers and sisters in Christ if you're never with them? If you're never around them? You might say, well, we have technology today. We have cell phones and we have the internet. And we have all this stuff. And those are fabulous means of staying in touch. But we all know what it's like, the difference, that when you're physically face-to-face with somebody. Right? You can't give a hug over Skype. You could try, but it's not the same, is it? There is something about gathering together 
You know, and this is why, you know, in our modern day of technology, a lot of churches, even us, we're moving towards being able to stream our services online and to have, you know, online services Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And, and, and all of those things are great, but they're, they're, they're a great supplement when, for when you can't physically gather together. Listening to Bible studies on YouTube and other things, those are great supplements when you can't gather together with other believers, but they're never meant to be a replacement Because when you gather together, it says there, you're able to watch out for one another. You're able to provoke love and good works. You're able to encourage them. And and, and, and there's something different that happens when we are physically together. And so Paul saw that. And that's why he said, look, you guys are the church of the living God. There's something dynamic and supernatural that happens when we gather together, when we worship together, when we study together. Again, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with with studying on your own. You need to do that. There's nothing wrong with worshiping on your own. You need to do that. But those things aren't intended to be a replacement for gathering together in a local church with a body of believers. And then the third thing he says is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. So the church is God's family. The church is the temple of the living God, the structure that God dwells within. And then he calls the church the pillar and foundation of the truth. These are graphic architectural metaphors, right? Um, Some of you may have heard this phrase before, a building is only as good as its foundation, right? When we were over in Israel, we we saw all kinds of uh, ruins all over the place, right? The buildings are gone, but guess what remains with all of these ruins that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years? The foundations. When we went under the temple, the, we went to the western wall, and then they have these tunnels that actually go underneath the city. You know, the city has been built on top of, of these tunnels. And so you go into these tunnels, and you look up, and you see like 35 feet above you. That's the street. And so you're walking along these tunnels, and you're actually looking at the foundation stones of the Temple Mount. And one of the first places you come to, it's this big old display they have. They, they show you this stone that weighs 450 tons. And it's one of the hundreds of stones that makes up the foundation of the Temple Mount. Now, first off, you're like, how did they get it here? Right? And there's these little, like, like almost two by four size notches like all along the side of this thing, and they think that there was some type of mechanism that like lifted it up, and I'm like, still, 450 tons, right? How many two-by-fours is that going to take, you know? (laughs) And then they go through and explain some of the ideas and the concepts and stuff, but what's really amazing is that these stones are, are fitted together, you know, like if you put two stones together, they don't overlap at all. They're perfectly lined up stacked on top of each other, and just stone after stone after stone down this whole hallway. It's amazing to see that. But it's striking because you step outside and you realize the temple is gone, but the foundation is still here. Nobody tried to move the foundation. And so the church, what his, his concept here is the church is the pillar and the buttress. The foundations is, is the word he uses there. Um, He's talking about how the church provides the solid bedrock of truth to the world. That we are the foundation of truth to the world. That's what he means by foundation. That we are, we are the foundation that truth builds upon, that comes up from. We are the solid ground that truth stands on. And then he says pillars. You guys have all seen the pictures of temples, ancient temples, and they got the pillars standing up and they're holding up the roof. And, and, and those pillars... They would always stand on the foundation as columns, and they would give structures their beauty. They would give structures their, 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 just their, their structure, you know, to hold things together. And really what he's saying is that the church, as pillars, hold up the truth in this world. That we stand for and uphold the truth. Now, of course, God is the source of truth. I'm not saying that the church is the source of truth. Um, truth comes from God, right? Truth doesn't come from the church. But when the church is faithful to God's word, When we are faithful to God's word, then we become the foundation and pillar that God's truth builds upon and goes out into the entire world. When that foundation of God's truth is shaken, that's when the world looks at the church and, oh, hypocrites, and I'll, and yeah, and you guys don't live what you believe, and and the whole thing crumbles. 
which goes back to Paul's very purpose. He's so concerned with the conduct and confession of the church because it affects the mission of evangelism. Now, these realities of how he described the church, they really lay an awesome responsibility on the church, okay? Um, as, as a foundation undergirds the building, right? As the pillars support the roof, the assembly of believers, the gathering of individual Christians who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we are appointed to uphold and undergird the truth that is re- re- revealed through Christ in this world. We are to hold it up. To hold it up to the world so they could see it and understand it. This is a divine call to allow the word of God to saturate all of your life. To saturate every area of your life. This is why you always see pastors like, hey, you should read every day. And you should memorize scripture. And, you know, don't just bring your Bible on Sunday and Wednesday, but keep it with you. You know, and this is why I personally love technology. Because my Bible is in my phone. And any time, no matter where I'm at, I could just open it up and I could read the word of God. We're to saturate ourselves with it. We're to be inundated with with just the word of God in and through us. To be thinking about it and chewing on it and studying it and and, and reading it. The truth of the Bible is, is to form the foundation and pillars of your life. That's why we believe that God's word is God's word. I had a YouTube comment a couple weeks ago when I was gone in Israel. Um, Somebody commented on, on one of my Bible studies that was posted there. And they say... They, the, this was their comment. I'm not going to read the whole comment, but their comment started this way. But God didn't say that. Paul did. And they went on to tell me why my teaching was in error because, you know, that doesn't line up with Christ, you know. And after all, it was, only, it was Paul that said that. And so my response to them is, which parts of Scripture are just Paul speaking and which parts are God's Word breathed by God as indicated in Timothy? No response. No response. Because the answer to that question is, all of it is God's words. It's his truth. God's word, the Bible, is to be everything to us in the church. Everything. Everything. The preface to the 17th century Geneva Bible said this, The Bible is the light to our paths, the key of the kingdom of heaven, our comfort in affliction, our shield and sword against Satan, the school of all wisdom, the glass wherein we behold God's face, the testimony of his favor, and the only food and nourishment of our souls. I love that. Light, key, comfort, shield, sword, school, glass, testimony, food. That's the Bible. It's so key. It's so key. And if if you neglect the Bible in your walk, I guarantee your walk is suffering. If you neglect the Bible in the reading and the study of the Bible, I guarantee you your your faith is probably shallow or at least not as strong as it could be because you aren't undergirding your own life. You aren't building a foundation of truth in your own life and you aren't supporting your your own life on the pillars of the truth. And so what's going to happen is something's going to come along and shake your life and you're going to look like all those ruins I saw in Israel. Boom. Boom. Everything falls over. And it's funny, in a lot of the archaeological sites, they'd like put the pillars back up, you know? And it just, it looks pathetic. I mean, it's cool, but it looks pathetic. You're like, you know, all these pillars fell down, and we, we put them back up, you know? You're like, they're just going to fall down again, you know? Next time an earthquake happens. And that's our life, you know? If we're, if we're trying to build things on our own efforts, when the shaking comes along, it's going to fall down. That's why we have to be committed to God's truth, God's word, to read it, to study it, to fall in love with it, and whatever you got to do. I get it. It's hard, right? It, it's, it's, it's hard. I struggle with the same thing. I'm like, oh, it's a textbook. Nobody likes reading textbooks, right? It's like, no, it's God's word. God, it's God's love letter to me. Oh, but man, I'd rather read about like dwarves and elves and, you know, fantasy stuff from Tolkien and, you know, dragging the exciting things and, it, you know, my flesh is like, you know, but, but my spirit is like, no, this is nourishment. This is the very thing I need to get through today. And then tomorrow, I need it again to get through tomorrow. And on and on and on. And so this is what Paul is talking about. And this is what all these things kind of bring together. These three phrases make a compelling picture that, that 
as the church, what, what that means, that means we are family. Now, some of you in this room might not know other people in this room. And that's okay. I mean, it's not like we have to be best friends with every single person. But as family, it is a good idea to try and branch out and get to know the people around you. Because how are you supposed to provoke them to love and good works if you don't even know what their name is? How are you supposed to encourage them if you've never had a single word of conversation with them? That's one of the reasons why on Sunday mornings we do the, you know, hey, greet somebody you don't know, right? And it's always somebody you don't know because our tendency is we go greet the people we already know, right? Hey, I know you. How you doing? Cool. Awesome. All right, let's sit down and get on with the Bible study. So, so step out. And some of you, you're like, nope, that, that's a scary comfort zone. You want me to step out of there. But, but just give it a shot. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm glad you're at my church and, and you know, whatever. I mean, I don't know. But, 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 but step out and, and start to take that step of saying, how can I as a family member here show my other family members that I love them, that I care about them, and, and, and to be a part of the opportunity to provoke them to love and good works? We're to love each other as brothers and sisters who same, share the same heredity. We're, we're, we're the church of the living God. That, that we come together as multiple individual temples of the living God. But when we come together, we are, uh, we're alive in this dynamic, unified community that so much of Scripture talks about. And then as the church, we are the pillars and the foundations of truth in this world. That the truth of God's word is the, is the bedrock, the mortar, the bricks that our lives are built upon. And then as our lives build up through that truth, we hold that truth up to a world that desperately needs it. So these truths... This is how God, or Paul, described the church, all right? Um, these truths are embedded in the key verse of 1 Timothy. So go back to chapter 3, verse 14 with me, and we're going to read 14 and 15. And this is the key, key verses to this whole book. Paul says, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. The conduct of the church is of such concern to Paul that, that basically all of chapter 2 and chapter 3 are a call to impeccable con conduct. Holy behavior and un uncontentious prayer is the theme of chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Dressing modestly is the theme of chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Biblical church order is the theme of chapters 2, 11 through 15. Godly leadership, godly elders and deacons is the theme of chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. It's all about their conduct, but, but the motivation, the reason, goes back to chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul said, this is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why Paul is so concerned that we behave properly. Because our behavior will affect the witness that we proclaim to preach. And I don't know about you. But I don't want to stand before God when all things are done and ever have to explain, well, you know, I, I was a total bad witness to this person. And yeah, they, they actually never got saved because they looked at my life and they thought, hypocrite, this person claims to be a Christian. They're living like a big sinner and they, and they don't seem to repent of it. So why do I need it? I don't ever want to have that conversation with the Lord. I want to be able to say, God, I lived for you. I screwed up. I stumbled. But I lived in grace. I lived in mercy. I extended truth. God, God, I just, I, I lived in the way you wanted me to. This verse is even more compelling in the light of the understanding that, that we are a family, a gathering of people that are filled, indwelt by God, that we are the repository and the heralds of the truth. When he says he wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, when we understand it's us, we are the vehicle that God wants to work through so that everyone will get saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We are the entity. We are the organization. We are the people. We are the, the vehicle that God wants to do that in. And so when we live out what we are in Christ, God is pleased to, to enhance the preaching of the truth of the gospel. He enhances it. He, he supports it. He undergirds it. And so verse 16, Paul goes on to say, and most certainly... The mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, 
preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. So after Paul just got done stating that, that the church, this entity of people and dwelt by God, we are the pillar and foundations of the truth. He goes on to answer the, answer the question, well, what truth? What is the truth that we are to uphold? What is the truth that our relationship together can affect? What is the truth? Well, he goes on to say, the mystery of godliness. Every time Paul uses that word mystery, he's referring to Christ as the revelation of the previously hidden plan of salvation. That's what he's referring to. The mystery is the fact that God himself would come to this earth, clothe himself in flesh, live a perfect life, and die on the cross as a sacrifice for the entire world. That was the mystery. In the Old Testament, people were like, how's God going to save the whole world? Even the angels were like, how's God going to save the whole world? And so that's why he calls it a mystery. And he goes, the mystery of godliness is great. What he's saying there is that the person and the work of Christ are the key to godly conduct. The work that he did and who he is is the key to godly conduct. Jesus makes godliness possible. So the mystery of godliness, the mystery of who he was and what he did and what he came to do, And how that works in and through our lives is great. If you just trust him, if you just depend on him, if you just live obedient to him, you're going to live a godly life. If you just do things the way God wants you to, you're going to live a life that reflects him to the world in a way that is appropriate and leads to salvation in people's lives. And so Paul then goes on to, to quote six lines of, of what's called a creedal hymn about the person of Christ. And so there's, there's three pairs of, of contrasting couplets, he says here. The first one, he says, he was manifested in the flesh and vindicated in the spirit. So this first couplet, he's going on to describe Christ and his work, right? This is the mystery. This is what it's all about. The first couplet here deals with the revelation of Christ. He was manifested in the flesh. That's referring to, obviously, his birth and his incarnation. The fact that the eternal, pre-existent architect and judge of the entire universe, the second person of the Trinity, at a certain point in time, stood at the rim of the universe, looking into creation, and dove headlong into creation, and flew past billions and billions and billions of stars, and flew through the Milky Way galaxy into the womb of Mary where he swam and grew until his birth on one cold wintry night, as God himself was incarnated into his creation, manifested in the flesh. And then it says he was vindicated in the Spirit. Other translations say that he was kept righteous by the Spirit's might. It speaks of the opposite bookend of the life of Christ, right? God born in the flesh, the opposite bookend was he was resurrected. Romans 1.4 explains that Christ was appointed to be the powerful Son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Appointed means declared. He was declared. His resurrection is what declared him to all of creation that he was the powerful Son of God. Then in Romans 8.11 it says the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead talking about the Spirit of God, that God himself, the Father, is one who raised Jesus from the dead. So this first couplet here, as Paul is talking about, the mystery of godliness is great, the source, the foundation, the, the very, very place where godliness comes from. Christ himself, it starts with his manifestation in the flesh and starts or goes on with him being vindicated in the Spirit. It sings of his supernatural incarnation and his resurrection that revealed him to be the Christ. And, and, and this is the Jesus we're to confess. This is the Jesus we're to be preaching to the world. That he was God who was born in the flesh, who died on the cross, who rose from the dead. That's the Jesus we're to be preaching to people. That's our confession. Then he goes on to say, seen by angels and preached among the nations. This is the second couplet that deals with the witness of Christ. The contrast of witnesses here, you have the heavenly angels and the earthly nations. One is supernatural, the other is natural. One is superhuman, the other is just simply human. So he says, seen by angels. The angels saw everything. 
they foretold the birth of the Messiah to Mary and Joseph. Angels filled the sky at his birth and saying glory to God in the highest in Luke chapter 2. After his temptation, the Bible tells us that it was angels that came and ministered to Christ. In Gethsemane, when he was sweating great drops of blood, Scripture tells us that an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. It was an angel that witnessed the resurrection and sat at the empty tomb. It was angels that comforted the disciples as Jesus ascended to heaven. And presently, Jesus, adorned in glory, is surrounded by a vast angelic host who is constantly singing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Yeah, he was seen by angels. He was witnessed by angels. And angels were, were, were the closest to him. But then you have the, the earthly nations, which is referring to the Gentile nations. They were the farthest removed from Christ. And yet still the whole realm of intelligent creation saw Christ and is without excuse. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 tells us that his invisible attributes were clearly seen by all of creation, that nobody is, is with excuse. Nobody can say, I didn't know there was a God. And then it says, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. So this is the last part of this confession. Paul's talking about church. You're, you're a family. Church. You are, you, are, you are indwelt by God. You guys are the structure, the temple of the living God. Church, you are the pillar and foundation of the truth in this world. And what is this truth? Jesus Christ. Believed on in the world and taken up in glory. This deals with the reception of Christ. The reception is seen in two different geographies. You see it in earth and you see it in heaven. So it says he was believed on in the world. John chapter 1 verses 10 through 12 said he was in the world. And the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name. That's us. That's Christians. That's the family that Paul was talking about. But at the end... This earthly reception was crowned with his heavenly reception where it says he was then taken up in glory. This is referring to the ascension of Christ. So this little confession here is, 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 is summarizing the entire life of Christ because everything is about him. Everything is about what he did. The very life that we have is because of him and what he did. The very opportunity we have to live for him is because of him and what he did. The very source of our godliness in our life is because of him and what he did. The very place of our victory is because of him and what he did. Do you get it? Can you imagine how the angels reacted when he came back to heaven? When he ascended to the right hand of the Father? Right? The angel holding the flaming sword of Eden, saluting him. The angel of the apocalypse that has one foot on land and one foot on the water is like, oh. The archangels, Michael and Gabriel. I mean, just can you imagine the, the shout of praise and glory as he ascended back into heaven after being on this earth and all these angels have been like, what are you doing down here, dude? And come on, you're sweating blood and stuff and you're God. What's going on? And then they see the mystery. He saved every living human being for all time. How magnificent. The point of all this is that the spectacular Christ of this, of this mighty confession makes possible the godly conduct that Paul is so eagerly encouraging us to have. We are the church. We are the household. We are the family uh, of God. He is our father. We are brothers and sisters. <laughs> I'm not going to move. He lives in each one of us individually and collectively. We are the church of the living God. And together, we are the pillar and foundation of truth in this world. And because of this, what we believe about Christ, what we confess about Christ is everything. We confess that he was revealed by his incarnation and his resurrection. We confess that he was witnessed by heaven and earth. We confess that he was received in the earth and in heaven. And because we are the church and because we confess this Christ, we can. And we must conduct ourselves in a way that brings him glory. One of the ways we bring him glory as a collected household of God is when we gather together to take communion. This is an opportunity and a moment that we take in the church to remember 
everything we just talked about, to remember who he was, to remember what he did, and to, and to celebrate what it meant. It is a holy moment to honor him as the church of the living God by remembering him in communion. Now, communion is for the child of God. If you are not a child of God, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, do not take communion. That is sacrilege. However, if you realize and you're here tonight and God has spoken to you and you know that you need to repent of your sins and you need to accept him as your Lord and Savior, in a moment I'm going to pray right before we take communion. And then as you become a child of God tonight, forgiven of all of your sins, adopted into the family of God, you are more than welcome to come and partake of communion with us. And so let's pray real quick before we do communion. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you, God, for the truth of all of it. Lord, I pray right now, God, for every single person in this room, Lord. Many of us are your children, God. We are a part of your family, and you are our Father, and we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for taking so many different people from different backgrounds and different issues and binding us together as brothers and sisters. Lord, it truly is a miracle, and we thank you for it. But God, for anybody in this room tonight that does not know you, as we are about to take communion, God, to celebrate and to remember what you did for us. Lord, I want to give an opportunity for anybody that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior to receive you tonight. And so while we're praying, the heads bowed and eyes closed, if you want to receive Jesus Christ tonight as your Lord and Savior, the gospel is very simple. It says this that you have broken God's law. You are guilty of sinning against him. And just in case you're like, well, what, what, what do you mean? God gave us the Ten Commandments to be a mirror of the fact that we are not good moral people, but quite the opposite. We are sinners who have broken God's law. If you've ever sin lied, if you've ever stolen, if you've ever looked at anybody with lust, that's just three of the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says very clearly, if you've broken one, you're just as guilty as if you've broken every single law of God. That's the bad news. That the penalties of sin is death. But the good news is that God loved you so much that he came to this earth, lived a perfect human life, and then died your death on the cross 2,000 years ago. He took the penalty for your sin. He died your death penalty. He took your execution so that you wouldn't have to die. He shed his blood and his body was broken for you so that in faith you can cry out to him and say, please forgive me, God, of my sin. And as you receive what he did for you on your behalf, God's word says that you can be forgiven. And you can know from this night forward that when you pass from this earth, Instead of a hell pain for your sin forever, it's going to be an eternity in heaven with your creator. And so while we're praying, heads bowed, eyes closed, if you want to receive Christ tonight, you know you need to repent of your sins. I just want you to raise your hand where you're seated. Let me pray with you. If you want to receive Jesus, God bless you in the back. Anybody else? God is speaking to your heart right now about your need to receive forgiveness. Just raise your hand where you see it. Let me pray with you. God bless you on the side. Anybody else? I see you in the back as well. Anybody else in the last couple moments here, you need to receive Jesus tonight. He is knocking on your heart right now and you know you need to do this. Don't let this moment pass you. Just raise your hand where I can see it. Let me pray with you. All right, Father, we thank you, God, so much for what you're doing. And we thank you, God, right now for these two that have said, I know I need salvation. I know I need forgiveness, God. Lord, your word promises them that as they, as they cry out to you right now, God, that you have wiped them clean of every sin they have ever committed, and you are wiping them clean of every sin they will ever commit. That, God, from this night forward, as they stand before you, you see them as perfect, spotless, without blemish. God, as your loved child, thank you, Lord. And so for those of you that raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Just repeat after me. There's no magic in these words. The Bible says that if you mean this from your heart, you are saved. And say, Lord Jesus, I know I have sinned against you. 
I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Master. Be my friend. Teach me how to live for you and honor you with all that I am. Thank you for loving me so much that you would die in my place. In Jesus' name, amen.